So, hi everyone. A little backstory. In seventh grade, my mom was diagnosed with a meningioma, which for those of you who don't know, is a type of brain tumor. It looks kind of like this. So you can imagine how much my world shifted after that. Because of a tiny less than three centimeter long piece of overgrown flesh in my mom's brain, um, I was forced to consider the possibility of never seeing my mom again, having to pay medical bills, trying to find the best neurosurgeon possible. And I mean, there was a possibility that my mom's skull would have to be cracked open like a nut. And now she's essentially recovered, but yeah, neuroscience kind of changed my life. So when I say the word neuroscience, most of you high schoolers here will probably think, not another boring STEM talk that I have to listen to. And you're not wrong. Neuroscience can be incredibly difficult to understand. After all, we're talking about the brain, an organ that is essential to your identity and basically controls every part of your body. But it's also incredibly interesting. My name is Bridget Liu, and as a student researcher at ASDRP investigating the efficacy of polyphenols on Alzheimer's disease, I'll be changing, I'm here to change your mind. I'll be talking about what happens when your brain malfunctions because of Alzheimer's, why it matters, and its impacts. So what is Alzheimer's? Most people here have a relative or know someone who has Alzheimer's. Personally, my grandfather has severe Alzheimer's, and now he doesn't know who I am, who my mom is, he can't control his bladder or his bowel movements anymore, and he needs a full-time caretaker. But obviously, my grandfather isn't the only one with the disease. After all, in the US alone, more than 5.8 million people have Alzheimer's. And it's also the most common cause for dementia in older adults. So if you take a look at this slide here, this is what the normal brain looks like. And I like to think that it kind of looks like a walnut. But this is what a brain with advanced Alzheimer's looks like. And as you can see, if the normal brain is walnut, then the brain with advanced Alzheimer's looks like a very shrunken walnut. It's so much smaller because the connections between the brain cells and the brain cells themselves have died out, which directly affects a patient's symptoms. And here is another picture of the normal brain versus a brain with Alzheimer's. Okay, so Alzheimer's symptoms are typically classified in four stages, early, mild, moderate, and severe. Beginning with early stage symptoms, patients begin to have memory problems. However, most people are actually diagnosed until mild stage, where patients begin to develop personality and behavioral changes. And they're essentially no longer able to complete daily tasks like the rest of us do. And then in the moderate stage, that's when things really start to get bad. Imagine not being able to recognize your friends or your family members anymore. You can't learn, you start to hallucinate. And then severe stage hits in. That's when a patient develops a complete dependence on others. They can't talk anymore, and they can only communicate using grunts or moans, and their, blood, their body no longer works, basically, the way it's supposed to. Basically, when your brain stops working the way it's supposed to, you suffer a lot. Okay, so what happens on a cellular level when we're looking at the disease? Short answer, patients produce fewer neurotransmitters, which are chemicals that your brain produces for cell communication, causing your brain cells to die. Kind of long answer, your brain produces a protein called amyloid beta, which in a normal human being is just a byproduct of a cell cellular breakdown of a larger precursor protein. And your brain also produces a protein called tau, which normally functions to keep your brain cell structures stable, according to the Na Norm National Institute on Aging. However, in a patient with Alzheimer's, amyloid beta begins to clump together and it forms these plaques, which are highly toxic, and so does tau protein. And that's what seems to cause Alzheimer's. And so, as you can see in this picture right here, the brown clumps that are shown are basically amyloid beta plaques. And as you can probably tell, they're not very good for your brain. So here's an analogy that you can use to visualize this. If amyloid beta and tau are like small rocks, in Alzheimer's disease, they bunch up together and form massive boulders that stop cellular communication. However, scientists still can't confirm 100% that amyloid beta and tau protein are the direct causes of Alzheimer's. But this hypothesis, or the amyloid cascade hypothesis, is currently the dominant theory in the scientific community of the cause of this disease. And so as you can see here in this flowchart, it looks very complicated, but essentially what it's saying is that amyloid beta um, clumps together into these plaques, and so does tau protein, 
and then that causes dementia ultimately. And although there isn't a guaranteed known cause of Alzheimer's, uh, we do know that there are a lot of factors that contribute to this disease. For example, mutations in the APP, PSCN1, and PSCN2 genes are all uh, risk factors for early onset familial Alzheimer's disease, and brain trauma and inflammation can also trigger it. And so now you might be thinking, why does any of this matter? Because of treatments for Alzheimer's, there's no cure for it in the status quo. But we do have prescription drugs that relieve symptoms. So this table here looks very complicated, but essentially it's just a showcase of the current drugs that we have available to treat Alzheimer's. And so the first three shown here, donepezil, rivastigmine, and galantamine, uh, or sorry, galantamine, are all cholinesterase inhibitors, which basically just means that they're types of drugs that work by stopping an enzyme that breaks down the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. And this is really important, since acetylcholine is a chemical that's crucial to memory. And when less acetylcholine is broken down, your memory is improved. And so here on this table, we have memantine, which is the fourth drug shown. And when the chemical glutamate binds to your, your brain cell receptors, uh, it allows calcium ions to enter your cells. And this is normally okay in regular humans. But in a patient with Alzheimer's, calcium ions overwhelm these brain cells and become toxic. So memantine, our fourth drug here, basically just works by stopping glutamate from binding to its receptors in the first place, leading to less cells dying because there's less toxicity. And so when doctors treat patients with Alzheimer's, what they essentially do is they just mix and match uh, these drugs based on the stage that the patient's in. Finally, though, I want to talk about a specific drug that's been, that's been in the news recently because of how expensive it is and also its efficacy. It has a very long name, but it's called Adekanab. And I showed it this in this diagram here. Adekanumab works by providing antibodies that directly clear the amyloid beta plaques in your brain. And in doing so, it involves your very own immune system. So all five of these treatment drugs are perfect examples of how important research is. But adekanumab in particular shows the progress that we've made. From just targeting symptoms to targeting the potential cause of this disease, because um, it targets amyloid beta. And it shows what the future could be with enough funding, research, and interest. And so now we come to the future of Alzheimer's. There's a lot of different potential drugs and treatments that are being researched. Gene therapies, drugs that target the immune system, and more. However, the world needs more neuroscientists, researchers, and neurosurgeons. We need more people who are interested in neuroscience. So in essence, neuroscience is both an incredibly diverse and interesting field. And Alzheimer's disease is just one aspect of it. So I urge everyone here to look more into the brain. For students, consider taking neuroscience as a possible college major in the future. Either way, neuroscience can change your life, and it can also save someone's life. Thank you.